Welcome to the Startup Grind. So, welcome. That's loud. It's good. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, real quick, this is Startup Grind, and uh, we're part of the global, a global, of, you know, there's 35 chapters around the world. Uh, with the you know the head office in uh, the main chapter in San Francisco, and we have a tradition that I didn't know about until recently. Uh, it's going to upset you guys because most of you, if you got pizza, you got to put it on the floor. Because what we're going to do <laughs> is the same way we do it in the US, and we're all going to get on our feet and give a warm round of applause for Mikel from Zendesk. <laughs> I also wanted to give, uh, Zoe, please put your hand up. So she helped me put this <laughs> event together. Um, it, and you know, I know that you guys have got your own startups. When you got the money, because I bet she's expensive, Bench PR, Bench PR. So she looks after uh, Mikel and Zendesk, and she also looks after the Zero guys. I'm gonna give you this. I got one. You still gonna hear them all right? I think I'll still give you this. That's good for the camera. I, I think you can hear me without, can you? Can you hear what? That's still gonna go, still gonna go through this though. <coughs> I think you need this one. <coughs> Do I need this one too? Up to you. For the crowd. Can anyone hear? Yeah? Yeah? <coughs> All right, no one. I think everybody can hear me, can't they? You can hear me through the... It's better with one. It's better, yeah. it's better with one. Yeah. All, right. Use the <laughs> All right, so I'll be the one yelling. Uh, for some reason, York doesn't have two microphones. Anyway, um, yeah, I'll go back and forth. <laughs> welcome, Mikkel. Um And welcome, everyone. Hello. Hello. We'll both be yelling. <laughs> Is this one of the more organized events you've been to? <laughs> Wet them with table <laughs> tops. <laughs> Batteries. <laughs> They're not energizers. It happens. <laughs> Alright, we'll get started anyway. Um, we've still got a couple of seats up here in the front if, if any of you guys want to sit down. Um, Alright. Can't be over here. It's too nice. There you go. Probably get some spit. Too. We'll throw the mic in in a minute. Alright. Welcome to Startup Grind. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for um, coming. Uh, it's a big deal to us. As you can see, we've got a great attend. Um, and um, yeah, basically tonight, I just want to hear your story. Um, let you know, people hear about your failures, your successes, everything that's, I mean, made you you and made you approach Zendesk, uh, you know, the way you do. Um, and you know, as we were talking earlier, I, I really appreciate if you can uh, give us also those insights into the failures you've had, and uh, you know I also talked to you about life balance, all that kind of thing. So I'm just going to uh, prong you from time to time, but I, I really want to kind of keep it un uninterrupted, and I'm just kind of going to talk to you once in a, once in a while with a question I think people are thinking. Um, but can we first go back to uh, the young Mikel uh, before the four beautiful children? What was the education, and um, how did you get started in an online business? Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we I'm, I flew in from uh, from uh, Tokyo this morning, and we've been in Sydney all day. And I caught something just before leaving uh, leaving Tokyo. So I have a sore throat and. It's generally miserable, so uh, bear over with me. I don't have a lot of voice, um, but I'm I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm uh, very proud about our operations here in uh, in Australia, and especially our office here up on Burke Street. Uh, we have a great little place, and I'm I'm pretty sure that you're all very welcome to come by. We have a rooftop terrace, and we have barbecues from time to time. So uh, please uh, please feel f feel free to swing by. What is it, Burke Street number? 482, that's a big ass center sign, so you can't miss it. 
I think we put that center sign up in the middle of the night, not yeah, to yeah. deal with the city. Yeah, great. <laughs> First rule of, yeah, startup. Um, <laughs> anyways, <coughs> so um, I'm, you know, I, like a lot of you guys, I got my first computer when I was very young uh, and always been messing with computers. I don't have like a formal computer science background or computer science education or anything like that. I've just been nerding with computers for my entire life. I have more like a commercial e economy uh, oriented uh, formal education. Uh, and it's always been kind of the crossover uh, technology, business kind of person in whatever I've been doing. So, so that's a little bit about my background. If you don't know Sendesk, we are a customer service uh, solution, meaning that we provide a customer service product for a bunch of companies out there. We have more than 25,000 businesses as customers today. A lot of these businesses are small, medium businesses, but we also have a bunch of larger organizations in there. I like to emphasize SpaceX because they send freaking rockets into space, you know? <laughs> and uh, Playboy, just to put that out there. Uh, <coughs> Disney. Disney. <laughs> Disney. Disney. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, we got them all, basically. Never pay their bills. No, 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 they do. <coughs> um, uh, but so we got a bunch of of great customers as our uh, companies as our customers. And we've also been very fortunate to work with a bunch of these Silicon Valley startups uh, before they became the big, well-known brands that they are today. So companies like Twitter, companies like Yammer, companies like Dropbox, Airbnb, Groupon, uh, all these kind of companies we've been working with since they were tiny little companies. Groupon became a customer of ours when there were four guys in a room up in Chicago. I remember like the first conversation we had with them. I was like, dude, what, what's with these guys? <laughs> like, ah, let's, you know, forget about them. <laughs> they will never turn into a real business. Um, and they've been, as you know, the fastest growing business in the, in the history. They, today they have more than beep, thousands agents all over the world using Sendesk each and every day to support hundreds and hundreds of millions of uh, users. <coughs> so we've seen a lot of these in great Silicon Valley's histories from the inside and been a little bit part of these histories, which just is a, you know, a fantastic privilege uh, to try. So you didn't have the traditional uh, computer science background. <coughs> what, was, what was your education? Uh, um, it, it's in it's Denmark. It's called so I'm yeah. So the funny accent. I'm from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. We formed Senders in Copenhagen. Me and my two co-founders. Um, and uh, I have a it's called a market a degree in market economy. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> you mentioned your founders and going through. Um, you guys can hear me fine without the microphone. Yes. So uh, you mentioned your founders, and my understanding is you built a company with these guys early on, did your own thing for a while, and then bring them back in for Zendesk. Can you go through just like the first startup you you you, you built? Yeah, I had a in the when is this Michael ninety seven ninety eight something like that. So this is your other your founder here. No, Michael was not. A, Michael was living in Hong Kong when we formed Zendesk, um, and. Uh, he was extremely bored, so he said, "Like, <laughs> let me work with this." And so he set up our first, what was our first customer service, what we call customer advocates operations out of Hong Kong. Uh, you hired a bunch of uh, Chinese students, the local students, to work with you, and basically just to make sure that whoever kind of reached out to us, we gave them proper care. Uh, so he set up those operations and turned kind of the customer service into a customer customer acquisition machine for us. Um, so uh, Michael was doing his own thing basically <laughs> while we were building the product in uh, in Copenhagen. No, I had, so Michael and I used to work together in a different startup in my first startup, uh, which was a we did a product for white labeled uh, communities. Um, and it was a very different business. We built it was a based on, you know, Oracle databases, uh, web logic uh, application servers. It was a J2E stack, you know, just to get up and running with that shit. And you spend I don't know how much money on all kinds of stuff. 
um, crazy, crazy expensive, expensive stack. But we sold it to big media organizations and financial institutions and so on all across Europe. Um, and um, just a very, very different business. But it was a nice business to have when you see these big checks come in. Um, it, it, in 2001, the market changed completely and we really, really suffered from that because we were many, in many ways self-financed and we spent all the money we had on, on growing the company. And when you are a company where you are reliant or when you, when you rely on these big checks, check changes in the market can hit you so dramatically. So that's also why like, when we, wanted, when we found out that we wanted to build another company, it was a completely different model, a subscription-based mm -hmm. model. Um, and where we targeted a lot of customers rather than just a few customers. And that became very much the foundation for Senders. Okay, so we've got like an hour here. Right. So feel free to, to, to give us uh, as much detail as you want. And what, what I really want to do is, <coughs> I guess for, for most of the guys here, they know that they know Zendesk's a success story. So is it possible for like, I mean, this is, you know, it's going to take you back, but was there a landing page to start with? What, what was the very <laughs> beginning? Who came up with the idea? How did you know, oh, we're onto something? And then, um, you know, when did you go, oh, look, we need to raise some money on this? Or was it a matter of, um, you know, the, the business that you had from before financing Zendesk? Or how, 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 how did the Zendesk start? And how did it uh, um, acquire customers? And how did it grow <coughs> into the monster that it is now? Um, there, are many, there are many ways to tell the founding story of a company. Um, when I talk to bankers, I have one version. Yep. Um, we don't want that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think also, like, honestly, this is also a, a story about three guys who are at a point in their life where if they don't, you know, get their act together and start really executing on their dream, on, on their passion for, in our case, our passion was to build a product. Uh, they realized that they would never, <clears throat> they would never do it. And we were all in our, you know, late thirties, and and uh, we just saw this. Like, if we didn't do something about that now, we would never do it. Um, two of us been in the in the customer service industry, not from providing customer service, but in implementing these types of customer service solutions. Uh, both from the technology standpoint and from a, like a business process standpoint. And um, like the customer service industry five years ago was just a terrible, terrible place to be. Um, it, you know, I always say like, you, don't, you didn't pick up girls working in a help desk. Um, it was very much like help desk were a, a cost center for companies. It was all about making sure that the customers didn't steal the valuable time of the employees. You, we all remember like five, five, ten years ago where everybody outsourced their support to India uh, or to other uh, low cost uh, areas. Uh, we remember Dell, how they suffered so much from outsourcing all their customer service. Even IBM outsourced all their internal help desk to a third party company. You know, talking about it, it, uh, you know, you know, creating a huge distance to your own employees. So, like, it was really, it was really for the, for the, you know, customer service was really for the bottom feeders, and it was just like uh, figuring out how to spend, you know, how to save as much money as possible on customer service. And the systems that were out there, kind of, they just reflected that. They were big, like, process monster machines with a hundred buttons and you know, really, really rigid systems, very extremely siloed, almost impossible to get any sense of like visibility. There's no visibility, no transparency. There was no empowerment of the people actually providing support. There was no empowerment of the people getting support. Uh, so it's just like such a loose loose for everybody. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, and uh, there was like, these systems weren't integrated with any of the modern kind of channels. Yeah. Um, we hadn't, like there was no web integration, there was no email integration, all these things like didn't exist. It had all to be custom built. So you had like these big implementation projects, you had big process consultants from all the big consultancy people. And they spent a lot of time on building all these, sorry, 
Mm. They spend a lot of time on building all these process diagrams and training all the people of these organizations how to use these extremely complicated systems. And of course, the organization said like, well, now we spend all this money and all these expensive consultants and all this expensive equipment <coughs> and so on. Let's get our cheapest people to, <laughs> to use the stuff. It's just like crazy, you know, they put in people in front line facing their customers and it was the lowest paid people they could find. And of course they couldn't figure out using the systems and everybody just suffered for it, from it, especially the customers. <coughs> so, you know, that was very much the state of the market, you know, five, ten years ago. Of course there are exceptions, but in general that was very much the state of the market. So we said, okay, let's build a system where we build in all the best practices. We hide them for everybody and we pre-integrated with all the modern channels on which we communicate today. Uh, we make it really, really sweet, you know, <laughs> focus on sweetness. So was this, can I ask, was this you getting pissed off from a phone call to India or, or a frustration that you had that got it, you know, got, got the ball rolling or? I think it was just like after implementing a couple of these projects, and seeing how miserable the results were, you know, I, I, it was just very obvious that we could just do this so much better. Nobody had, no, it, it, I think also these, these, a whole generation of these kind of systems flew on under the radar because it was a super, super unsexy industry. Like back, you remember like the early startups, it was all about like working smarter and project management and you know base camp and 37 signals and everybody wanted to be 37 signals and do work smarter and CRM systems were hot and so on. Nobody, nobody focused on the help desk because you didn't pick up girls in the help desk. I'm sorry, that's just how it is. Um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try that a little a bit, little bit later and you have to say it with me, okay? <laughs> <coughs> Um, so it was an extremely underserved market. We got together, first of all, first two of us, and then uh, the third person, who uh, Alex, who was not in the customer service industry, had never touched the area before. You know, he screamed and said, "No, I will never work with that." But um, we, we, uh, he could, he could bring a dimension on these kind of systems that became extremely important for the success of Sender. He was your developer, this guy? No, so my, my two co-founders are much more technical than I am. Yep. Um, and they all have, you know, various skills in design and back-end and front-end development. Um, so <coughs> in the first year of kind of, we've spent, I think, we spent a year building the product before we launched it. Um, and like, it's a year, that's the toughest year to get through because like, you have to figure out a way of, earning, you know, getting a living, having a living throughout that year. And you have to keep like three very different people focused on building something that, you know, you know, you don't know if it really is going to happen. And you know, you each have your personal issues to deal with and each of you have to go out and make some money from time to time. So that part of a startup's life is so, you know, fragile and so much stuff can happen there before we really get to launch. So we weren't like, let's just get it launched and then see what happens. We wanted to come out with a product that was fully functional, including like a billing backend and all that stuff. Uh, so I think we spent like a year on off building the product before we launched it. And then we launched it and it was very much like, we build it and they will come. We spent something like, initially something like $50,000 on various online marketing uh, programs to get visitors to a website. <clears throat> and we could find out that with the help of Michael and his uh, uh, advocates team that if we could get, if you build a very frictionless uh, website, if you build a very frictionless uh, trial experience, and if you build a very frictionless buying experience, and if we ensure that you got this instant gratification in the trial process, uh, we could get for every 100 visitors to a website, we get four of them to sign up for a trial, and for every four we could get one of them to convert into a customer. So it very much just become a, a process of, okay, let's figure out how we got how we get more and more uh, visitors to a website. And we didn't realize that back then, you know, it wasn't like, that was not part of our business model. We didn't have a business model per se. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't until later that, that people actually realized that the, 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 bis the funnel model in itself is a business model. Um, 
So that was, we launched October 2007, so that's a little over, was that, five and a half years ago. Um, and then we, uh, we spent a lot of our own money. So uh, I don't, I didn't, you know, we all cashed out on our pensions and, and all that stuff. So I was gonna say, uh, you know, a lot of guys um, kind of see, you know, lean startup um, as the Bible, you know. Um, was there, but yeah, I think pretty much everyone, everyone that I've had on stage so far, well, so far, I guess, was like, we, they just had a gut instinct that this was gonna work and they built it and just put it all on the line to do it. Was there much in the way of testing it? To, let's see if the customer wants this before we go any further or build any features that are not needed. Was there any of that that was taking place? I think initially you run as fast as you can, like, and you chase every ball <laughs> <laughs> and you don't get a lot of sleep. Um, like in like that, that first moment when you start getting trial users and trial customers, it's like you know you have to do everything. You try to do everything, and you kind of you mini pivot a lot in the initial phase. Like for example, <coughs> one of the we always thought that we would build a <coughs> sorry a customer service solution for known users. Because we said like all customers, all companies, they know their customers. So let's build a system for known users. But then we realized that all the, all the, all the people signing up to try the product, they wanted to be able to, to deal with unknown users. You know, people that may be customers already but wasn't registered as customers or people that were prospects, something mm -hmm. like that. They wanted to treat them all in the same way. And so we very quickly created that mechanism of saying like if an unknown user contacted the system like for an email or whatever, we would on the fly create their profile. Um, so it's a, like you don't think about it today as being a big thing, but that was a very big thing for us back then. So you do a lot of these little pivots to ensure that you cater for uh, your initial customers' uh, try, uh, uh, feedback. And I, Getting a lot of trials initially is super, super important because <coughs> then you get a lot of feedback and you can navigate all that feedback. So one of the things we were very lucky with, you know there's an ad network called The Deck? So if you go to websites like Laughing Squid or the 37 Signals blog or some of these Mac blogs and so on, they have a tiny little ad uh, with a little bit of text. And it's a very kind of exclusive ad network. Um, and back then it was still in the early days, but we could buy a tiny little ad for $5,000. Um, and of course that was 10% of our budget, but we tried it. Um, and uh, because we came out, suddenly we, we reached an audience that were completely untraditional for customer service systems. Um, but like within you know, a few weeks, we had a thousand of these people signing up to try the product. And that's when we kind of realized there are people out there who have actual customer service needs and probably don't have anywhere to go because they don't want to go out and invest in all this big, expensive, crabby, bloated stuff and they don't have like a big internal IT department to help them with all of that. So we, at that point in time, we, we realized that there's just a lot of companies out there that have customer service needs. And at that point in time, they didn't have anywhere else to go to find something that was lean inexpensive and kind of without being super intrusive on them. So that gave us, that gave us a lot of confidence. We were, we were not very good at converting them into customers because they were people from, you know, they had, you know, it was a, it was a kind of a, you know, a mix of people, but they had all shown the interest to go in and sign up for a trial. And that's how we got some of our very first customers um, that we learned so much from. And that was, was that, was that what, what, helped you kind of, you know, drive you to keep going? That just to see, oh yeah, that, that's our first customer and that became like so uh, exciting for you that you're gonna keep going. There's some value in this, I know it, let's keep going. And um, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's a miracle that we went through that phase because, you know, we're just people and you know, when people get kids or when people get stuff happens, you know, their priorities change and, and it's very, very hard to keep people focused on a task where you don't know really, you don't know anything about the outcome. There's complete ambiguity about what's going to happen with that company. There's complete ambiguity about when will you ever get like a decent paycheck. Um, so keeping people together in that phase is, 
it's uh, it's really really complicated. I think like we got we came through that by determination, by yelling a lot at each other. Yeah. You know, that's just founder dynamics. It's not very pretty. Um, uh, but we've always been kind of. I think we complement each other really well, and and that's probably what it takes, uh, because. <coughs> I've talked to other people who like who are in the face of their startup, and then they say, "Well, my co-founder, he 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 doesn't add any value, you know. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm I'm coding everything. He just sits there and blah blah blah." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is that like to build a company, you need very different people, <coughs> and. Uh, and they all have their moment of shine, you know, where they add value to the company. I, I'm not very technical, you know, so the product was built without me really adding value. <laughs> and my two co-founders, they kind of had to deal with me in that, in that period. I was the guy who came with all this process knowledge and blah, 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 I told them, oh, you're doing it wrong, you have to build it this way and so on. That's uh, that, that can only go wrong, you know. It's it's a terrible, terrible recipe. Uh, but you know, you have to get through that period because we all have our moments where we add value to the company. Uh, so later on, when we started talking to customers, when we started pitching the doc, uh, the product, <coughs> and so on, I my role became more substantial, um, and um, and you know, throughout our lifetime, our our kind of value adds to the company have changed. So would you see yourself as more of like a business development kind of guy? Were you were you the one that you know reached out to Disney, for example? Fuck no. <laughs> no. So how, how does that how does that meeting take place? When you like, is this a matter of you have uh, like so many customers? Like, I'm going to start approaching corporate clients now, or you wanted to get some some big names on the board early on, or wait for them to come to you? How, how did how did these people come on board? No, so uh, our business model is always about. Provide giving online marketing, or, or, you know, investing in online marketing, investing in evangelism, investing in word of mouth, and having companies come to us. So wow. we have every month we have something like ten thousand companies trying out our product, and they come to us on their own. And then we have a bunch of them just sign up for the product, submit their credit card, and they become customers. A bunch of them wants to talk to a sales guy. So when we reach somewhere between eight and ten thousand customers. We agreed to put in a sales force, uh, an inside sales force. They didn't do any outbound, everything was inbound. Um, so that those customers that wanted a little better treatment, that wanted to talk about the contract, that wanted to have a proof of concept or something like that, they had somebody they could actually talk to. Um, until that point in time, everything was uh, based on a self service experience, basically. Okay. Uh, before before we get into uh, so you're at this you're at this struggle right now. Could I ask how did the how did the the finance come into play, and what were these you know these milestones or uh, you know um, targets that you had to get to to um, you know tell a tell a good story in front of these investors? <laughs> um, so um, we very early on began pitching various like. Uh, VCs and so on in Europe, and it, that was all just a big w- waste of time. Um, but so what we did, we and which was, you know, very unique for us at least in Denmark, was that we did a uh, family and friends round, uh, or it's, it's called family friends and fools, um, and asked them to put in something like five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars each. Small amounts, but if we got together a good group of like 20 people or something like that, uh, it amounted to a decent amount. So that was our first round. Um, and this was in early 2008, before the credit crunch. So people had a lot of like free equity in the houses and so on. So it was a good time to go out. It was a good time to go out and do a family and friends round. Um, we then got approached by a German angel investor. And we were like, no, 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 we just raised, we just raised the family and friends round, we don't want your money. And that's, of course, that's the best situation to be in because then they really want to invest. Um, so we raised a little money for him too. And then we started pitching American VCs, especially through his network, he helped us a lot. He had a good uh, network with VCs. 
and uh, uh, I think we spent, I spent over the period of a year, I spent something like 10 days every month in the US uh, creating networks, pitching VCs and these kind of things. It takes a while to kind of to build up, uh, to build up the network to, to raise money, especially when you're a foreigner. Because they don't know who you are. You have a funny accent. And like they can't call anybody to, who is this guy? You know, um, we were lucky that a bunch of these Silicon Valley startups start using our product. Because suddenly we became visible to these VCs. They're like, hmm, three of my portfolio companies are using this product called Sendesk. Uh, so suddenly we became very interesting to them. So once we kind of cracked that market open, made our Series A, everybody wanted to invest in. So we've always been in a position, you know, after kind of the initial phase, where uh, we didn't need to make, we didn't need to raise money, but raise money. That's always the best situation to be in. Um, and when you raise money, raise twice as much as you need. That's another rule of thumb. Um, so we've kind of been fortunate, and of course, you know, it's. The, 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 first, the first round is always the most complicated one. You know, when, when you have the first round, you have the validation. And then because then, especially for a foreigner, then local VCs, they know somebody did the due diligence. Somebody knows about the IP stuff, the taxes, has done background checks on the founders <coughs> and all these kind of things. So once you kind of crack the first round, you know, suddenly it becomes easier, at least if your business is going like this. You know, if your business is not going like this, everything is different. So, do this. <laughs> um, uh. So, so can we go back to the, <coughs> the, the difficult round? Because I'm just always in, uh, interested in, in, in how people try and sell this concept. Because I know everyone goes in there with the, you know, the PowerPoint with the chart, it's like that. You know, come and, you know, invest in us. This is where we're headed. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of users are there? How many, you know, is it 10,000 users? I'm always, uh, you know, I'm always interested in, um, I've heard about, a, you know, planning for a three, three year, three years out and just saying this is where we're going to be in three years and then kind of working it backwards and that's want to kind of get a percentage of, how, how did it work for you? Um, it's uh, like, for all the advice you get about this, you can't trust any of it. You know, it's it's um, it like if you can't like, I think the key is to get somebody to be truly interested in what you're doing. You know, and and so often that's purely coincidental. Like our very first VC, that was a partner in Charles River, it went just called uh, Devdut Yalaka. He had, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> he had done some research on the, on this industry, but from a more higher level, because they had an old portfolio. I think I can't remember the exact story here, and I should probably shouldn't mention it on camera either. But um, he had done some research on this market, so he already came to us when we met with some background about this. He knew something about the industry we were disrupting and so on. That didn't mean that it was, you know, an easy job to get the, the his partnership and the company to invest in us. But kind of we were on the same team from day one. You know, we were working with him to persuade his partnership to invest in us. Um, so you need to identify that person within that partnership that you can get to be passionate or like truly interested in the thing that you're doing somehow. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's in Silicon Valley, it's, it's things are just different there. It's a little bit like Hollywood, you know, things are very different. Um, so a lot of the investments you read about on TechCrunch and so on, it's people that already know each other, you know. The VCs always invest in people they know. It's a lot easier because then they know what they've been doing, they know they're good guys, they know what they won't fuck around, et cetera, et cetera. So it's much easier to, to invest in somebody that already, that already has a track record. Um, but when you come into the town as the new guy, it's so, much, it's so much more complicated. And the best thing you can do, of course, like focus on the product, get traction, get customers. And you know, as an eye-opener, getting Silicon Valley companies to use your product is a good eye-opener for the VC community. 
in terms of getting their attention. Great. All right. So <coughs> back to Zendesk now. You, you've 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 kind of got through this struggle period. You said you got to about nine thousand users before you put the sales force on. Was that correct? Yep. Yep. Um, and this, you're still in you're still in Denmark at this point. Uh, no, 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 no. So we um, so we started pitching our Series A in. 2008, and uh, initially it was a very kind of uh, very good process, um, and we were very close to uh, closing on Series A. Uh, but then, kind of from one day to the other, you had this credit crunch, and that really, you know, there were people, there were people in Silicon Valley that lost, sorry, that lost half their fortune from one day to the other on the credit crunch, like the stock market completely, you know, tanked and. Uh, that really, really changed the market. So we had to kind of work against that in these times and figure out how to raise money. Um, and that was really, really tough. You know, that was extremely tough. But we were lucky again to get all get through this. So I think we closed our we closed our round in. Uh, I think we signed the term sheet December thirty first, two thousand and eight. And I think we closed the deal a few months later, and then, uh, and part of that deal was that we moved to the U.S. Uh, and uh, and uh, and so we started that process. And That's quite common, correct? I think that you know, if you if you pitch American VCs, they would like to have you close, so they don't have to travel around the world to understand what you're doing. But I think it's also it was also part of our desire, you know, the American dream. Being in Silicon Valley, being in San Francisco is fantastic, you know. Um, both from like a personal perspective. I know you have great climate. It's fantastic here in Australia. I'm from Denmark, which is this big, and it's cold and flat and gray. <laughs> so coming to San Francisco from like a personal family perspective, best thing ever. But besides of that, it's also like being a technology startup in San Francisco, you are the most valuable and interesting industry in the city. You are the center of the universe. And that is fantastic. <laughs> um, and I, I really wish that for everybody to try that because as a tech startup, you know how it is. Like he, I, I will, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing here in Australia. Like if you are, if you're not into mining, you know, you're not really bringing money home to the country. You know, it's cute that you work with your little iPhone thing and computers, but it's like, yeah, come on, you know. <laughs> and that's how it is where I come from. You know, it's it, yeah, yeah. Oh, you do a start. Oh, that's very cute. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> um, but like in Silicon Valley, you are the center of the universe, and that's a fantastic feeling. And there's a whole, the whole uh, community, the whole service industry is kind of built around people like you. So that's an amazing experience. But that's also why it's, it has a great company building culture, which makes it easy for somebody like us to come to San Francisco, free guys, <laughs> you know. We, we got Michael to move over with his wife. We got a few other people to move over. But we were like very much like a bootstrap operation. Hired a big fucking office space. We took over the old, what, what was that company called? Uh, Microsoft's ad agency. Well, the, oh, Razorfish. Razorfish. We, took off, we took over their old office space. Uh, and this was like in, what are we talking? Uh, October 2009. Yeah, summer of 2009. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was still like the credit crunch still impacted the economy so we could get like cheap, uh, uh, cheap office space. It, the, the job market wasn't terrible, meaning that it was terrible but, not, but good for us. Um, so, um, so that was, and, and within three years, you know, we hired all these people, built up all these processes. And today we have, a, we have a company with 350 people and offices all around the world and customers all around the world. And there's only one place you can, you can do that, and that is Silicon Valley. You know. Of course, there are exceptions, but in general, every, because that's what happens to everybody. The, the building we moved into, our neighbors were Yammer, uh, Eventbrite, uh, TechCrunch. Uh, play them and a few others and you know these are all billion dollar companies we had so much value under that roof it's crazy um, and it was all just you know some dudes <laughs> um, and you know Yammer got sold for like 1.2 billion Eventbrite is going after an IPO there'll be a big IPO too uh, we'll go after an IPO um, 
So uh, your question was, sorry. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, so, so the San Francisco, move to San Francisco. Now, you got three guys who said move to San Francisco. We talked to you know Chris from Zero, uh, so he, he he was talking about um, you know picking your battles, and also I mean it sounded to me like not scaling too fast, which is kind of you know, right, contra contradictory. But it's uh, he, the way I took it was that the worst thing that can happen is you come to the office on Monday and you don't know who you know who the fuck's in the room, right? <laughs> yeah. So what? How did how did that? You know, was there mistakes that were made, or would you have done things a bit differently as you, you know, exploded like that? Um, no. <laughs> there was, you know, we made a lot of mistakes, like every single day. Uh, we keep making a lot of mistakes, uh, but you know, that's that's life, kind of. You know, you don't learn anything if you don't make mistakes. Um, have we scaled too quickly? I don't think so. Have we scaled too slow? I don't know. Um, like you have to, again, if you have the opportunity uh, and if you have the right things in place, go after it. I, I would never be afraid of not scaling fast enough. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, you don't build a startup to say, oh, let's, you know, let's see how, how things kind of, uh, if you have the momentum, like fuel that momentum. like. Keep adding fuel to it because it's like if you had the momentum, if you found a model that works, just keep investing in that bitch because you know that that will bring you, you know that will bring you to another level and you want to be at another level. And is that a matter of just going? Look, I know. Uh, sorry, your friend here, Michael. 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 Is that a, Michael? <coughs> you got to go back to bloody Hong Kong now, or you got to set up office in Japan. Is it a matter of like? I just, I count on these guys and I know that they'll do a good job wherever I send them. Is that, is that oh yeah, I think, you know, a, a, you know, building a company is all about the people. Yeah. Like, because I, 80% of the stuff that's happening in, in Sendesk, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> like, you know, you have to, you have to build, you have to build an organization and empower the people to make decisions. So, you know, as your company grows, there's overhead and some, like we have a big finance, IT and legal department today. Like we have 50 people doing stuff and, and that's just the price you pay for, for growing growing at a certain pace. Um, so San Francisco, then went Melbourne and Sydney? <coughs> no, we don't we don't have anything in Sydney. Everything is here in Melbourne. So Michael has 20 people here in Melbourne. Um, I think, what is it, six, eight of them is a... Yeah, uh, engineer. uh, engineers and developers and yep. their explorations globally. So uh, yesterday, or the day before, they released uh, Shopify integration about got big commerce and Magento. This is one of the guys, Oh, cool. <laughs> so that was something we started on uh, a few years ago. We started building up engineering satellites. Was it was Melbourne because of Michael? That's why that move was there? Michael, he had a house here. Yeah. So that's why it came out. <laughs> Melbourne, now you said you just got back from Japan. What, what are the plans for Zendesk? Yeah, so we just, when is that, yesterday? Yeah, I think no, so. No, day before yesterday. We, um, we, f we, had an, uh, we announced our formal incorporation in Japan, which is a long process. Now, can, can Japan do business in Cuba? Oh, no, <laughs> God, no. Uh, um, so we now have a local country manager, and he's hiring at least five people uh, over the next, uh, uh, within the next year. Um, and start uh, servicing and selling to uh, local customers. We already have something like a little over 100 customers in Japan. So, um, <coughs> so um, you know, Japan is a super interesting market. It's a very homogenous, big market. Uh, you need to crack it before you can come in and scale your operation. But you know, we're in it for the long term. Uh, it's we've been. We've always thought about our business as a global business. So we, uh, our first customer was an Irish telecom. Our second customer was a chain of gas and convenience stores in Texas. Um, and uh, so we've always been working from a global perspective, but we've always, ev always everything been English only. So our big markets have been the US, have been UK, have been Australia, New Zealand, of course, Canada to some extent. Um, it's not really English. Um, <laughs> um, and um, so 
moving outside of the English speaking market uh, is a somewhat bigger challenge because like it, it requires you to there will always be customers in non English speaking markets that you can sell an English product to but if you really want to scale in a market you need to go local you need to go native so uh, we now support something like 12 languages on the back end so you can have the the back end interface in you know French German uh, uh, Chinese. Chinese, Japanese, all kinds of <coughs> all kinds of languages. The front end we support something like forty different languages, but for four key markets: Germany, France, uh, Brazil, and Japan, we've also got like local documentation. We have uh, local support resources. We have local websites, uh, and plan to do local billing and so on. The, the Japanese guys, you said you had 100 people, uh, 100 big customers already. Was that, is that sometimes, all right, Nike comes on board and Nike says, is, you know, is it Zendesk for everyone? Is that how you've got the 100 clients from the big global clients to kind of roll, you know? I think we have some of that. Uh, I don't think in, 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 not in really in Japan. We have those, what are the MGM or? Uh, 20th Century Fox. 20th Century Fox. We don't have them anywhere else. No. From Australia and Japan, so. No. Yeah. So not really. All right. Well, I'm gonna like so. I'm gonna open it up for a few <coughs> questions if you don't mind. And um, yeah, go on, please, Mikhail. Give him a question. Tell me, tell him if you're using. Yep. Um, so you were work, working on this. And you had a job as well, or you quit that and just went full on into it. All all three of us were working as consultants. Yep. Uh, which is uh, both a freedom because then you can decide yourself when you work, but it's also like. Then when you work, you work all the time. So it's also a downside. Okay. So you're talking about the venture capital stuff that you were, you know, you were doing. And it sounds to me the like the venture really capital stuff. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, the work that you were doing going to you know the states and everything. But it, it sounds to me like you know it really came down to your customers that you've got and 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 the the the, the progress that your business was making. I mean, did it? Do you think you, do you do you think it was worthwhile, like, like do it, spending all the time with the with you know in the states <coughs> getting that network together? How how did that work? I so think it's like if you if you want to build a fast growing business, you need the uh, risk money basically, and the, you know Silicon Valley, San Francisco is the best place to raise that if you are a technology startup. So it's not, it's never a waste of time. I think. Raising money for us in Europe was a big waste of time uh, because there simply isn't, like comparing Silicon Valley, San Francisco to anywhere else in the world, there simply isn't as much money there as there is in Silicon Valley. It's, the magnitude is just you know, humongous. Yeah. Uh, so I know, I don't think it was a, uh, it wasn't a waste of time. And so in, in general, I would say that, you know, don't, don't raise money just to raise money. Like don't do all the networking doesn't don't let that kind of distract you from building your business. It's mu always much more important to build your business. Um, so get the initial money as easy as you can. Like if that means, you know, cashing out your pension or cashing out or taking a loan in your house, do that because that's way you know that's way more easier than anything else. Um, so you can invest that in getting the traction. <coughs> Once you get the traction, it becomes more visible. <clears throat> and then it's it then it becomes easier to raise money from VCs, and like it is with VCs, like there are a bunch of assholes out there, uh, but there's also some very very talented and good people, and you know you're going to spend a lot of time with them, a lot of time, and they're gonna know all your weaknesses, they're gonna like <laughs> they're gonna know everything about you. So you feel like you hadn't spent that time, even though your business was getting all the profile and you were doing very well and you've already had money. In your first round of capital right? Yeah, but you spend that quickly, you know. Yeah. No, no, but what I'm saying is you feel that 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 that, that they you were saying they were coming to you, you were batting them off with a shooting stick. Our <coughs> until until our series A, you know, our series A was very, very hard to close. After that it became a lot easier. Yeah. Was there some some guys that you went and saw early on, kinda of shut the door on you, that you kinda of sent in a cocktail party later on and said, Hey, you remember me? Um that's, that's, you know, of course, that's how it is. You know, that's the game of Silicon Valley. You know, there will be people who says no to you. 
There were people who said no to Google. <laughs> there were people who said no to Microsoft and all of this. You know, there's always been people saying no to things they shouldn't have said no to. And there's of course been companies that, or VCs that said no to us too. Um, so, but you know, that's always the next round. Yeah, no, I was, uh, I was more saying like, chance to go, yeah, that guy, you know, to gloat about it a little bit, but no, <laughs> no, it didn't happen. It's, 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 you know, it's a small place. So yeah, yeah. 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 So Zendesk has disrupted the customer service industry. What are you guys doing in preparation for the next disruption to how you guys have disrupted? I mean, in terms of looking forward, and where do you see Zendesk going? Yeah. So the question is like, what is the next disruption and how will Zendesk move forward? Yeah. So um, there's many things to that. First of all, like uh, you, I'm pretty sure that whatever product a business plan you're working on, it says in there somewhere that you will be more easy and simple than the competition. That's how we all start. Um, and then we have 25,000 customers and then our product is not simple anymore. <laughs> um, so you have, to <coughs> sorry, you have to be the first company to disrupt yourself. You always have to challenge yourself and you have to make some big decisions about taking many steps back and rebuilding and re-engineering. Um, so like, you have to be paranoid to disruption, basically. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's also like you, you will want to be that company that doesn't get disrupted you know, within a certain lifetime. You want to be that company that always pushes the end result. And we have many uh, dimensions we grow on, like the geographical expansion is one of them. Uh, we move more and more up market. Uh, we traditionally is a, a, a business for a product for small and medium businesses. We're growing upstream to a lot of larger organizations today. Um, and, um, and we also believe that in our product portfolio, we have the opportunity to grow outside of the, kind of the very traditional customer service space to help our customers learn more about their customers and how they can turn that knowledge into revenue. So we believe that we have a, a future way beyond just what we do today. Great. Take one more question. <coughs> uh, my question goes back to the first time you had your... Yeah. Stop looking at my crush. <laughs> 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 The fact that you were the first time you were uh, <laughs> trying to raise money for your Series A, and um, the whole inexperience in this in this area, how did you deal with that? How did you know what what terms to set the deal on, and what's, what's oh the yeah, for <laughs> like your first term sheet is such like oh, such a disaster because you have no idea what you're going into, and you talk to all these lawyers, and they all like bill you a gazillion dollars. And it's like you have all these different types of preferences and all these different liquidation things. It's just like, it's a freaking nightmare. You don't understand any of it. Sorry, can you just clarify a term sheet for the federal? So a term sheet is kind of the, the when the VC goes into like a pre-negotiation with you, they put like a term sheet in and say like, this is basically the terms for, what, for which we want to do a deal. And then after you sign a term sheet, they, there's a whole due diligence period where they have a lot of people looking into all your stuff, putting their arm up your, and, um, and basically just do all the due diligence to make them feel comfortable that no, um, you know, what do you say in English? There's no ghost in the closet. What do you say? Skeletons. Skeletons. skeletons hidden skeletons, or anything like that. Uh, so, and like figuring out what kind of dilution was acceptable and what we should, how we should price the company and so on. Like we had no freaking idea. And our benchmark were all the articles on TechCrunch, which of course are all the outliers, you know? So our expectations were crazy compared to what was the real world benchmark. Um, so I think I was lucky in that I got, I became good friends uh, with a with a guy who was in the VC industry. And we knew we wouldn't go with that company or his company, or that wouldn't happen. Um, but he 
gave me a lot of inside information into how the industry works. And that was, I think that was very valuable for me. Um, and could give me benchmark for what was a typical Series A, what was kind of vanilla conditions and so on. So maybe I didn't understand it, but I knew it wasn't outside the normal scope of what an agreement does. And I don't know if you know that, but basically when you do your Series A, basically you take your company, all of it, and you give it to the VCs. And then you have to earn it back. That's a very good, typical uh, setup for a Series A. And that's, that can be a little hard to accept. But that's very much how you do a Series A. Right. <coughs> I want everyone back on their feet again. Woo! Yeah. And uh, thank you very much, Mikkel. That's thank fantastic. You. Thank you.